All your years of paying tax, you helped us overcome our darkest hour. You, along with every other loyal taxpayer, helped build this nation. Thank you for every life you saved and for every risk you braved, for giving our future generation a healthy start. When you saw many of our vulnerable communities, you provided for them. When you saw our healthcare workers on the front lines battling COVID, you rose to the occasion and gave them the tools to save lives. Without your tax compliance, we wouldn't be able to fight a good fight. Thank you for contributing to the important services our vulnerable communities rely on every day. To all taxpayers and traders, continue to pay your tax because it matters to millions of South Africans who depend on it. Your tax matters. Good morning. Moleni San Bonani Huyamore. Dumela Ma Africa Amante. What do we say? This is the day that the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be happy in it. What a wonderful session to end the year. Spending it with you, our creatives, entertainers, sportsmen, and women. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and leadership that is here, welcome. My name is Dineo Zima, and I will be your program director for today. That today we have a lot of information sharing packaged just for you. As such, we keep to our promise, we will equip you, equip you so that we find it easy to comply and hard not to comply. So presenters of today will cover topics of interest to you. We will look at tax in general, estate process, debt process, Voluntary Disclosure Program. Feel free, ladies and gentlemen, to pose your question on our Q&A chat board. You can also send your question via our email, the email that we have created for this session only, which is creativeindustryquestions at sas.gov.za. This email uh, mailbox will be closed at the end of this session. Should you want to contact us, we, you can utilize our normal channels, our contact center, which can be called on 08000-7277. And you can choose option six, or you can email us at contact us at sas.gov.za. Remember, when you pose a question on the chatbot, you don't, you must protect your personal information. We don't want you disclosing your ID, your text reference number. We want you to keep that information safe. As you all are aware that we are experiencing a load shading as a country, um, don't be alarmed. This session is going to be recorded. You can find it on our SAS TV on YouTube so that you can just go back to it and then uh, refresh your mind should you want to refresh your mind. At the end of this session, we encourage you to take our survey that will appear at the end that survey help us to improve on how to service you and also maybe touch the topics that are of interest to you. Ladies and gentlemen, without wasting any time, I would like to call upon Dr. Razelani, who's going to welcome all of you beautiful South Africans. Over to you, Mr. Dr. Razelani. Thank you very much, Program Director. It is a great morning this morning when everybody came to SARS really to get information. Thomas Razlan is the head of taxpayer service um, charter and the ambassador thereof. It gives me great pleasure to find that there is a need to know and a requirement to be compliant from the creative industry. Possibly this need is because you want to be on the media for the right reasons, not the wrong ones. And of course, it is our strategic intent that there should be voluntary compliance by our taxpayer because enforced compliance is costly to both sides, to the taxpayer and also to SARS. 
But how do we want to create this voluntary compliance? Because this is the way we prefer, and this is the way we work. And the way we prefer and the way we work is depicted in our first three strategic objectives out of those nine strategic, strategic objectives. And those strategic objectives, they tell us and they tell you that SARS, first of all, is willing to provide clarity and certainty on tax obligations. And this session today is meant for that, to provide that clarity and certainty on tax obligations. Of course, in whatever we do, we want to make it easy for the taxpayers and the traders to comply and fulfill their tax obligations. It is, it is, it is, it is this kind of sessions, it is the visit to, to our website, it is the call to our contact center. It is the visit making appointments to our branches, which will make it easy for you to be able to comply and know your obligations. Of course, our third strategic objective is saying, when we have done the two, clarity and making it easy and people are not willing, SARS is saying, then we will make it hard and costly for those taxpayers and traders who don't want to comply. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, it is SARS time to say, we have a theory of compliance to share with you. And our theory of compliance is that we believe that most of the taxpayers are honest and simply they just want to fulfill their tax obligation with least amount of effort and cost. And that's why we receive kind in invitations like this to say, can't SARS, can't you talk to us as creative industry? Because the majority are honest and that's how we need to treat everybody. But we are also saying, if we want everybody to be able to comply and they've been struggling to comply, SARS has provided a vehicle and that vehicle is voluntary disclosure program where you come forward and you lift up your hands, you say, SARS, I've not been away. I've been doing things not the right way. Now, please, how far can you help me? I'm coming, I want to come clean. And this is what I can share with you. Through that program, SARS will help you so that you become compliant taxpayer. We will all recall what the Book of Wisdom states to us and talk to us. It says, give to Caesar <laughs> what belongs to Caesar. And therefore, give to God what belongs to God. And you will recall that text is one of the oldest professions which we are doing here. But again, the same book, the Book of Wisdom, it also talks about my people perish because of lack of knowledge. Mm. Lack of knowledge destroys so many people. Lack of knowledge destroys business. Lack of knowledge destroys life. And that's why today we are here to say we want to usher, we want to give you that knowledge. And all of us who are here today, we should all know that traffic lights or robots in South Africa and barrier lines and safety belts, which we put on, are not to help the traffic officer, but the driver. Yes. You don't put safety belt to help the traffic officer, even while you do it because you see him. Safety belt is to help you. SARS, as an agent of government, we help government to meet its social and developmental needs by collecting tax dues. And that's our role. And the tax we collect, which provide the public goods like building clinics, roads, and also the old age patient grants and so forth. We are here with you to say, how can we do that together? Therefore, when you are here and you are made aware and you get clarity, then of course we need to start to do the right thing. We cannot run away from tax as it follows us even to the grave through the estate duty. Therefore, it is not right for us to get the country maintenance similar to the child maintenance through courts. We need to come forward, agree and settle, and then everything will go well. 
Through this words, creative industry, I would like to welcome you to this webinar. You are mostly welcome. Thank you, program director. Thank you so much, doctor. I hear you. We don't want to be in the media for the wrong reasons. And we want to encourage voluntary compliance for our taxpayers. But we want to do that by making sure that our taxpayers are well equipped, they are educated enough to do their own taxes. Because what you just say, you say we perish because of lack of knowledge. And we don't want to see that happening with our taxpayers. Ladies and gentlemen, as we go on and keep into that promise, I would like to call upon um, Na Nanile Ledwaba. Nanile will be taking you through the basics of taxation. Over to you, Nanile. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nanile Ledwaba. As being uh, introduced by program, program director, I'm from taxpayer based broadening and taxpayer education. I will take you through to your presentation today. Okay. The purpose of this presentation is merely to provide an information and easily understandable format, which is intended to make provision of the legislation more accessible. And then also you need to know that we are not more than or above um, the tax law, the income tax law. The disclaimer of this information is therefore has no binding legal effect and the relevant legislation must be consulted in the event of any doubt as to the meaning or application of any provision. To build a smart modern SARS with unquestionable integrity, trusted and admired by government, the public, as well as our international peers. For the purpose of this presentation, we focus on the following strategic object objectives. It's making it easy and simple to comply, create awareness, clarity and certainty, make it hard not to comply, modernize the systems to provide seamless online digital services like e-filing, we have the mobi apps, and also use the data for insights, risks, and improved outcomes. Our points for discussions today, it's why do we pay taxes, the remuneration reduction process, tax threshold rebates, tax credits, and tax rates, royalties received, provisional tax, do you need to submit a tax return, completing an income tax return, ITR 12, administrative penalties and inclusion will have the record keeping. Why do we pay taxes? The reason why we are paying taxes is SARS, we've been uh, mandated to collect taxes on behalf of the government so that the government can be able to provide basic services, including health, education, welfare of social grants and old age pensions and socioeconomic services inclusive of policing. Every citizen enjoys the benefits of, of one or the other of the basic uh, services. The definition of our remuneration is an amount of income that is paid or becomes payable for services rendered or for some other reason. It does not matter whether the amount is in cash or otherwise. With this one of remuneration, I'll go a little bit deeper or just try to explain it for you, for your understanding. When we talk of remuneration, we talk of income. It might be of salaries. It might be income in cash or otherwise. In cash or otherwise, we mean that you may be, because you're in the entertainment industry, you find that you've received um, maybe a gift or something, or that you've been required to promote a certain product. And then let's say for argument's sake, one company gave you a car and then that car is the value of 500,000, but you are not told or you know that the car is to the value of 500,000. On that 500,000, when at the end of the year, when the company declares to SARS, it will declare that they gave Nani Lelidwaba the car to the value of 500,000. And then it will show on the RIP5, that specific company must give you an RIP5, or they might give you a gift hamper. That give, uh, that uh, hamper is also converted into money, where they look at the current market value of that specific hamper. Even if it's clothes where you're promoting clothes for a certain brand, 
also they do likewise also they'll also convert that into cash as well and then as you go through we have the, the date of receipt of where you've received your remuneration we look into that to say when did you receive your your income it's either within the specific uh, tax year or in the previous tax year so we'll look into that so also we have the date of accrual which you became entitled to the money or the income received or not necessarily received but also they also declared or showed to us that there's a certain money which will come out to be paid to that specific individual in cash or otherwise, we have the two basic principles which apply. It's either in cash or otherwise, which is in the monetary amount. Otherwise, the receipts or accruals can be in any form other than money. Amount determined, for example, at the market value, as I mentioned that you might receive a hamper or something, then when they give you that specific um, hamper or whatever product they may give you, they will look at the current market value, but also normally what the employers do, they also declare, and then you are entitled to get your RIP, which will show what is that current market value of that specific product which you've received. And then you go through as well, we have the resident where there are tax on worldwide income. And then ordinary resident of Republic of South Africa, it is where he's a permanent home or where will he she or return to the job if it's done or is it where he or his intention to return to his permanent home on this one of the resident when we talk of the worldwide income we talk where probably being the entertainer you receive a contract to say from maybe the local production company to say we need to shoot a movie in maybe for argument sake in zambia you will be there for six months but you are still the resident of south africa so we looked into that to say you to receive any foreign income from that or maybe you have some investments in foreign countries we look into that as well and then also if you have some trading some people they have the foreign holiday homes where they are renting them and then they receive a, an in, income which is a trade income as well you can also receive uh, foreign uh, royalties as well but what you need to know out of that, since 1st of March 2020, what SARS has done and the Minister of Finance, they've introduced some good news to say that there is a limitation or an exempt which will be kept, which is up to 1.25 million per annum. And then what you need to take into account as well, which I've said it, it was introduced as of 1st of, of March 2020. On the remuneration example, we have the table below, which gives an, an example of how the combined taxable income is calculated. In the case of a taxpayer who is, who is over the age of 65 years and receives an income of 240,000 from an agent A and 160,000 from agent B during the 2020 tax year. We have the taxable income from agent A, which was 240,000 and then from agent B, which was 160,000. And then during the year of assessment, then we calculated the whole two income which you've received from different agents, and then it gave us 400,000. The normal tax payable, which were deducted by agent A, it was 18,895, and from agent B, it was 3,375. On the assessment, when we added the two amounts together, it was 62,840. Then we will list the tax paid in the form of pay as we end withheld by agent A and agent B, which was 22,270. And then the amount due by a taxpayer during that specific assessment, it was 40,570. I'll take you through the next example. When I'm done, I'll give you much more clarity on these examples. On the example to the tax table, the table below gives an example of how the combined tax, uh, taxable income is calculated. In the case of a taxpayer who's, is, who's over the age of 65 years and receives an income of 240,000 from agent A and 80,000 from agent B during the 2022 tax year. The taxable income, it was 240,000 from agent A and agent B, they paid him 80,000. On the total assessment or on the total income, it was 320,000. 
The normal tax payable or the tax which was deducted from agent A, it was 18,895. Agent B didn't deduct any tax from that 80,000. And then the less, then we go and then we less the tax paid, which was held withheld by agent A and agent B. The total income, it was 18,895. And then the amount due by taxpayer is 20,800. On these two examples, um, what we are saying is that if you are having multiple jobs because you are into the entertainment field, you need to notify maybe your agent A is your main agent where you get your, your regular incomes from agent A. You need to notify agent A to say that, you know what, I've just got another gig and then they are paying me or they will be paying me 160,000 as per the agreement which you've had between the two of you or as per the contract which you've received. You can request agent A to overtake you more and notify them. Then they have, we have the systems in place, which is a payroll system, which will guide them on how much are they supposed to deduct from your pay as you earn, which they have to withhold so that they can pay it over to SARS. Or is either, you also talk to agent B to say that, you know what, I also have a permanent um, gigs with agent A. Could you please text me more? To be safe, you can advise agent B to say that, could you please text me at 25% or food 1%? And then they will withhold that pay as you earn and pay it over to SARS. During the filing season, or when we submit our tax returns, what will happen is that when we submit your tax return, then you get the outcome of your assessment. Then you will know whether you were supposed to pay SARS over or it. If you overpaid with the advice which I've just given to say, it's either you advise agent A or agent B to overtax you. The money which you've overpaid over to SARS through pays you in, you will get it back. It doesn't mean that if you overpay, then SARS is not going to pay you back. It will pay you back the money which you've overpaid to them. Income from more than one source scenarios below are not exhaustive. If a taxpayer um, that is employed and receiving an income from a deceased spouse uh, pension. A retired taxpayer that is earning his monthly pension and getting income from retirement annuity fund. An employed taxpayer that has other trading activities that, that will earn him an extra income besides his salary. A pension or employed taxpayer that is receiving investment income, which is local interest that is above the exempted amount. What you need to know is that on the retirement annuity fund, you may find that you've decided to keep um, or to make investment for your future pensions. Then you have retirement annuity fund. So those ones will have to also declare where you will also be getting RIP funds from um, financial services. If you have any extra incomes from trading activities, you might have rental incomes. You might be a sole proprietor where you're running your own trade as well. Those are the ones you will need to declare as well. On the reduction process, we have gross income. The gross income is all employees or taxpayers income except capital receipts or accruals. Examples, you have payments received for the sale of your home or any assets, et cetera. On the gross income, we are looking at all the income you've received during the year of assessment. Then that will form the part of your gross income. As we spoke about the income from different sources, you might have the one for promoting maybe uh, makeups, and then you also have another one where you are getting money from agent B, then you are doing movies. All those ones we are, we are talking of as gross income. Exemptions is interest from South African source and by any natural person are exempt from income tax. Under the age of 65 years of age is up to 23,000 per annum. And then persons of 65 years and older, then the exempt income which will be 34,500. This one we are talking of the local interest. If you have investments, which I would like to give an example on, you have invested maybe with one of the financial services within Republic of South Africa. And then let's say for argument's sake, you've invested 1 million. And then you receive your IT3B certificate, which, which you will get. Normally they issue them in March each and every, or at the end of um, March or end of February, beginning March, where you'll receive that specific certificate. And then they show how much interest you've earned during that specific 
year of assessment, then it will show that, let's say you are below the age of 65 and then your interest is at 50,000. When we talk of the exempt amount, we will take off 23,800 rent from that specific 50,000 rent. And then the difference is the one which will be taxed on. Same applies with the persons who are 65 and older. If the income or the interest uh, received from their investment, it was 50,000, we will exempt 34,500. Then the remaining difference is the one which will be taxed on. And then the other thing is that if you are married in community of property, whenever you do your submissions, if you've ever been in sales way, we will ask you, are you married in community of property? The reason why we do that is because now there's also some benefits based on that to say that with this one of the local interests or the investments which you have, we will split your investments into two, the interest and into two. And it doesn't mean that when we ask you that information in your spousal information, we will disclose it, your information or your investments income and to your spouse. No, we are doing it for tax purposes. Because now let's say I'll still stick to the 50,000. You are married in community of property, you've declared, and then you told me that you are married in community of property, and then you've earned the 50,000 of the local interest. What we will do first, or what our systems do, we will split the money into two. We'll take the first 25,000 to you, and then the other 25,000 to your spouse. And then we will look at the exempt amount of the 23,800. So on the 25,000, we'll take the 23,800, then the remaining balance is the one which will be taxed on. And then same applies even at the age of 60, 65 years and older. Still on the 50,000, we split it into two is 25,000 on you, 25,000 on your spouse. And then also, and as you look at it, the benefit of the exempt income is that the 4,500 rent, and then meaning for this one, the person who's 65 years and older won't have to pay any taxes on that. And then also we will look into to say that is your spouse not working or so? Because now people who are working, we have the record of them on our systems. If your spousal is not working, then they will have that benefit of that as well. But if they do declaration at the back, our systems will be able to tell what's happening with that. On the deductions part, the act prescribes that a taxpayer or employee may deduct certain expenses, contributions that they have paid from their income, expenses such, such as retirement annuity fund, pension funds contributions may be allowed. Taxable income is a portion of your gross income used to calculate how much tax you owe in a given tax year. In order to determine the amount of the tax you pay on assessment, it's important to determine first what the taxable income is. The determination of taxable income is this first, this first step in the calculation of normal tax. In order to determine your taxable income, there is a step-by-step -step process which must be followed. I'll go back to the deductions. On the deduction side, you need to know that um, looking into this one as well, if you are the person who normally does the donations to the registered public benefit organizations, you will receive the Section 18A certificate, which shows how much you've donated to that specific public benefit organization. It Either it might be one, two, there's no limitation on that. And then they will give you those specific certificates, which you call them Section 18A certificates. And then they'll also have to declare, declare to start to say how many donations they've received, which we call them normally, we say that they are the third party data information. So when we do your submission, your information, information from that specific public benefit organization will be pre-populated on your tax return. But if it could happen that as you do your submissions, especially the deductions, it's either retirement annuity fund, it's either your local interest, and then they don't show on your tax return, we'll have to edit manually. Okay. And then I'll go to the example of the reduction process. We have the gross income, as I said it before, the gross income is all the incomes which you've received during that specific year of assessment. And our year, year of assessment, it starts from first March each and every year. 
ending on the 28th or 20, 29th February each and every year for individuals. And then also less exemptions, which are tax-free amounts and local interest. We also have, um, we'll have the taxable income, then we'll less the deductions. And then on our deductions also, we have the travel allowance, which would have received travel allowance from your agent maybe to say that when you do the promotions, you have to travel from point A to from, from point A to point B using your own car, and then you also use your own money to buy the fuel. So now that one will be also part of that. But as per your agreement or the, the contract which we, we would have with them, then it will be very specific to say what will be your benefits. Normally we call them benefits, but when we come to such sites, especially with travel allowance, we treat it as deductions. And now also on the travel allowance, if it could happen that you're doing the promotions and then you've agreed that they'll pay you the travel allowance and then you don't travel or you don't keep record of your kilometers, you must know that you will be penalized not having kept the record of your kilometers. And then also we have the subsistence allowance. So the subsistence allowance is another deduction which you would receive to say that you've been away from your family you didn't have the job being with your family for that specific period. If you traveled within the local boundaries and then also maybe out of South Africa, the employer or that agent or that labor broker must give you a letter to confirm that for a number of days you were not around within your family, you went away for job purposes. And then also we'll have the retirement annuity fund to also have the tax-free investments. And then we also have to add the capital, uh, capital gains tax. With the capital gains tax, there's also limitations on, on that. And then on the capital gains tax, we also look into, for example, where maybe you have your property or you have multiple properties on one of your properties which you've been renting out under your personal capacity. You've sold one of the properties due to certain circumstances. And then let's say previously you bought your house in 2003, you bought it for 1.3 million. And then now coming 2021, you decided to sell your house and then it was sold in November 2021. So now, and then you sold it for 1.7 million. What you need to take into account is that <clears throat> You, you've incurred expenses probably when you're doing the house maintenance or when you had to improve or something got broken, then you spent money on your house. All those expenses which you've incurred when you're doing the repairing of your property, they will also be part of your expenses under the capital gains tax so that you are able to uh, declare the true reflection of what happened or the true reflection of your capital gains tax. And then we'll look at the total, the difference between the money which you've sold your property with and the money which you've bought your property with, inclusive of your expenses in CAT, including maybe the lawyer's fees that are also part of your expenses under the capital gains tax. If you need help, I think your tax practitioners or there are more guides on SARS website. At the end of this, you'll have the taxable income, which will determine if or what amount are you are we supposed to tax you on. And then also, there's another one, if we had to go down more on this reduction process, which is a medical aid. On the medical aid as well, we have medical aid, which have to add it on, on this reduction process. And then at the end of it, we'll also add donations tax, and then it will give us the, the actual taxable income. On the tax thresholds, tax rebates, and the tax rates, the tax rates from 1st March 2022 to 28 February 2023, which is the current um, tax rate which we are on now, which is started this year March, um, uh, the taxable income from 100 to 226,000, you will be taxed at 18 percent. And then on the taxable income of 226,000 to 335,100 rent, you'll be taxed at 26%. But what you need to keep in mind is that there's a certain calculation which takes place, especially with the one which I've showed you regarding the reduction process. So before getting to this, we have to say, for example, 353,100 will less you 226,000. Then we add it together with 40,680 plus the 26%, then it will tell us how much you're supposed to be taxed on. And then the other thing which you need to keep in mind as well is that 
with the accounting systems which are in place, um, they've done an easy job for people who are working or the, account, the accountants. They work on the annual income, not on the monthly or two months income. So what you need to know is that when you do your gigs, you can only get paid maybe a lump sum for that specific period. Then when you do your submission on your RIPFF, it will be very specific to say how long you've worked for that specific agent. And then we look into that, then we'll calculate and prorata your annual um, income to say how much have you received. And then on the last tax bracket is 45%. That's the highest um, tax bracket which we have. And then on the tax thresholds, we have the ages where we have a primary under the age of 65 years. Uh, the tax threshold is limited to 91,250. Below that, then you don't have to pay tax, but if it's 91,251, there will be tax implications and will be taxed at 18%. On the secondary one, between the ages of 65 to 74, the tax threshold is 141,250. And then the tertiary one at the age of 65 and above is 157,900. So it doesn't mean that if the person is 90 years of age, they don't have to pay tax. Everyone is liable to pay tax. And then the other thing which you need to take into account on the primary one, it says under the age of 65 years, we have kids who are into um, advertising, where they're promoting or they're advertising certain products. They are also taxpayers where they have to register for tax and then also they're liable for tax, but we'll also look at the tax threshold of how much they've received, if they're liable to pay tax or not. And then we'll also have the tax rebates. Primary under the age of 65, our tax rebate is at 16,425. On the secondary age is at 65 to 74, it's 9,000. What happens is that on the tax rebate, it doesn't mean that the person, if it's at 65 to 74, the tax rebate is only at 9,000. What happens is that SARS will add the 16,425 plus 9,000, which is the benefit. And then on the tertiary one, at the age of 65 and above, their tax rebate is at 2,997, which we will add 16,425 plus 9,000 plus 2,297. This one which will come into effect or into place after we receive the taxable income. We'll look at the PSUN, which was withheld by the employer, and then we'll also add this one deduct this one as well or reduce this one from the pay as you end with that and then we will see if you are liable to pay SARS or if SARS is liable to pay you. On the royalties received, entertainers who receive royalties may become liable to pay tax on those royalties received in the country of the payer of royalty. The payer may become liable to withhold tax on royalty payments. In the Republic of South Africa, withholding tax on royalties and the rights to tax royalties are dealt with in most, if not at all, of double taxation agreements concluded by Republic of South Africa, where South Africa will have the bilateral agreements with other foreign countries, and then that's when the double taxation agreements will come into effect. We don't want a situation where you have royalties, probably let's say in Namibia, and then you find that Namibia has the bilateral agreement with South Africa, and then Namibia, they fulfilled a certain portion of your um, tax on royalties. Then when you come to South Africa showing that you've received um, royalties from Namibia, then you also tax you. So that one, it will be shown and then you need to notify SARS as well. Royalties received will be included in the gross income if they are a uh, Republic of South African sources. It is necessary to establish where the true source of royalty is coming from. If the source is entirely Republic of South Africa, the royalty must be included in the resident's gross income. If, it's, if the true source of the royalty is outside the Republic, but it results from the use of royalty producing asset in the Republic, then the gross royalty is subject to the withholding tax of royalties. Section 35 subjects the gross royalty to a final tax of 15%. Therefore, no deductions are made against the amount of this royalty. 
it is only when the true source of a royalty other than copyright royalty is in the republic that a non-resident will be subject to normal tax within the republic of of uh, of south africa the other thing is that you might organize a gig as well as an entertainer maybe you call one of the nigerian performers to come and do some jobs here and then or you have an agreement where you say that I'll pay you royalties on producing your music here. Before you pay them that money, you need to withhold the 15% royalties and pay it over to SARS. I'm moving to provisional tax. A provisional tax is not a separate tax from income tax. It's just a method of paying tax due to ensure that taxpayer does not pay large amounts on assessments as a tax liability spread over to the relevant year of assessment. It requires the taxpayers to pay at least two amounts in advance during the year of assessments, which are based on estimate taxable income. When we talk of the estimated taxable income, if I could take you back to that example on the second example where you've received 180,000 and then on the 180,000 agent A takes two, but on another one which was 80,000 agent B didn't tax you. Then you can register yourself as a provisional taxpayer to offload the burden of paying huge amount during, um, the, uh, during the filing season or whenever you have to submit your tax return. So if you receive multiple incomes where they don't even deduct any taxes from your income, you can register as a provisional taxpayer and then you submit those tax returns. And then the Submission period is on the 31st of each and every August, each and every year, which is the first um, uh, RIP 6 or the provisional tax return. The second one, it will be on the 28th or 29th of February each and every year. On those estimates, you'll be able to tell us how much you've received. On the, on the estimates, you don't just thumb suck the numbers. It's from the amount which you've received within six months, or you can be able to calculate to say, okay, on the estimate you say, let's say in 2021, you've received amounts which were not taxable. Uh, it was, let's say 700,000, and then you had to pay SARS over the uh, undeducted pays you in or the pays you in which was not withheld. So now what will happen is that with the provisional in August, which, the August will cover from 1st March and then till August to say that within these six months, this is what I've received, I request SARS to, or I'm paying SARS over. So you will be doing your own self-assessment to say, this is what I have to pay over to SARS. And then also what you need to take into account is that on the provisional tax, we also take into account the medical deductions and some other of your interests as well. A third payment is optional after the end of the tax year, but before issuing of the assessment final liability. However, it's worked out upon assessment, then the payments will be set off against the liability for a normal tax for the applicable year of assessment. Mm -hmm. On this specific paragraph, let's say on your first submission, you said that you were able to pay SARS, you did your own self-assessment. You said that no, probably I must pay SARS 100, um, 150 rent. On the next coming one, on the 28th of 29th February also, you said, no, now I have to pay SARS 200. And then when we add it together, you've already paid SARS 350. But now as you come, you realize that at the end of the financial year that you know what, I should have paid SARS maybe 500 rent. So, Instead of me owing SARS to penalize me for under declaring my provisional, you have a grace where you can submit your third provisional tax return in September because now you're coming forward to say that SARS have under declared, please know that this is what I have to pay. I made a shortfall of 50 rent, I'm paying it over, then they won't penalize you on that. The first period, this payment must be made within six months from the commencement of the year of assessment in question. This means that for the year of assessment that starts on 1st March and end on the 28th of 29 February, the first period for which provisional tax becomes due will be the period ending 31st August. 
The second period, the payment must be made not later than the last year of the year of assessment in question. This means that for the year of assessment that starts on 1st March and ends on 29th, 28th or 29th February, the second period for which provisional tax becomes due will be the period ending on 28th or 29th February. The third payment is a payment also known as additional or topping up provisional payment must be paid not later than the effective date. The effective date is where the year of assessment ends on 28th or 29th February. The effective date is seven months after the financial year end, which is 30 September. For an approved financial year end, which ends on a date other than 28th or 29th February, the effective date will be six months after the financial year end. Example, financial year end is 30 April 2015. The effective date will be 31st October 2016. And then also what you need to keep in mind is that when the commissioner announces um, the filing season for individuals, which are normally starting from 1st, February, I mean 1st July, ending on the date which we have given us to say this is the end date or the closing date of submission. They also, uh, or he also announces the closing date of provisional submissions. You also normally have a period where ending in January to say that, okay, you also have a grace till January, taking into account of the 30th of September. The payment is in third period is a voluntary payment which any provisional taxpayer can make. However, taxpayers other than companies with a taxable income more than 50,000 or companies with taxable income of 20,000 or more may make a third voluntary payment to avoid interest in terms of section 89 quad two being levied on any underpayment of tax on assessment. Taxpayers need to submit a tax return to SAR so that the final tax liability can be calculated based on the income the taxpayers declare and the tax deductible expenses incurred for a year of assessment. In some cases, it may result in a refund. The annual filing season is when taxpayers will be required to submit a return. For individuals, it is announced by, by the South, Africa, South African Revenue Services Commissioner. And then what you need to take into account is well on the ITR of 12, because I spoke of provisional tax, um, when you submit the provisional tax return, it doesn't mean that you don't have to submit your ITR 12 return being an individual. You are still going to submit your ITR 12 uh, return to show now you'll be giving us the full expenses and showing us what expenses have you incurred when you received other additional incomes, especially from those ones which taxes were not withheld on. So you need to give us the full expenses which you've incurred, like being the entertainers, you've been told that on your agreement that you have to buy your own clothes for a certain gig, and then you spend certain money on that. You had to, or you were given instruction on agreement to say that you also have to wear a specific makeup or specific shoes. So all those ones being entertainers, you have to include that because that allows you to include all those type of um, deductions or expenses. An income tax return may be requested, requested, completed, and filed through the following submission channels. We have SARS Mobi app, which is for non-complicated tax returns. And then we have SARS e-filing. We also have the SARS branch where you have to make an appointment. We also just introduce the pop-up branches in certain malls where you can go to SARS website and see where are the pop-up branches and when are they open and on which days as well. What is an administrative penalty? An administrative penalty is a penalty levied under section 210 of the Tax Administration Act. The act prescribes the various types of non-compliance which are subject to fixed administrative penalties. For individuals, the penalty will be imposed where the taxpayers fail to submit a tax return and when required under the Income Tax Act for years of assessment commencing on or after 1st March 2006, where that person has two or more outstanding income tax return for such years of assessment. On this one of administrative penalties, I'd like to just explain a little bit further. <clears throat> 
there were advertisements to say that if you're receiving less than 250,000, you're not you're not supposed to submit your tax return. But what you need to know is that some people that are having certain deductions, you have investments like our local interest, you're receiving the local interest from your investments. You have tax-free investments. You also have medical aids or you're contributing towards retirement annuity funds. Maybe you're also receiving travel allowance from your employer. So on this one, you need to submit your tax return so that you can be able to determine whether SARS or you or not or you or SARS. So you shouldn't look at 250,000 or 500,000 500, only. And then also what you need to know is that if you've been non-compliant for specific years of assessment, let's say for five years, you've never submitted your tax return, the administ administrative penalties, they start from, or they will be imposed as from 250 rent per return per month and depending on how much you've been receiving. Taxpayers who do not submit their tax returns will be charged an admin penalty, which must be paid over to SARS. Regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the admin penalty, it is advisable to submit the outstanding return to stop further admin penalties. The penalty will reoccur for every month the returns remaining at outstanding for a maximum of 35 months. If you don't submit your tax returns, some taxpayers which have come across is that because they see that they've received um, admin penalties letters to say that now you owe SARS due to non-compliance and then you owe SARS 7,000. Then they pay over the, that specific amount of money. And then they still don't submit the tax return. What you need to know is that on that 7,000 which you've paid, it doesn't mean that it's not going to stop SARS from imposing other administrative penalties on you. First thing first, what you do, you submit your tax returns, those all those outstanding returns, and then later you make a payment. At least when you submitted your tax returns, you will be stopping SARS to imposing administrative penalties on you. Then later, then you make a payment. The administrative non-compliance penalty for the failure to submit a return comprises fixed amount penalties based on a taxpayer's taxable income and can range from 250 rent up to 16,000 rent a month for a month that the non-compliance continues. Let's say you have five outstanding returns, you only submit three. Even if you submitted the three tax returns, those two which you didn't submit, there will be administrative penalties imposed on you. What if I do not agree with the penalty? A request for remission can be submitted where a taxpayer disputes any penalty levied due to non-compliance. The taxpayer must provide reasons for non-compliance for the request to be considered. If the request for remission is disallowed or any portion was selectively allowed, you may still object to the decision made by SARS and even appeal decision the decision if you disagree with the outcome of, of the objection process. Let's say <clears throat> you've been battling with e-filing. You've tried severally. You've locked calls. You called our SARS contact center. You have multiple case numbers where it proves that you've been going to SARS requesting SARS to assist you in submitting your outstanding returns. What you can do, you can request a remission and object it, and then SARS will look into that. But you need to give specific reasons to say why are you objecting the admin administrative penalties. There are many ways to keep records. Choose a way of keeping records in a way that suits your business. Keep your invoices, till slips, and other information together. Have a separate bank account so that your personal and business expenses don't get mixed up. Let's say um, myself being a salary earner, I receive a salary to a specific bank account. Then I also have maybe a rental, I receive rental income. On the rental income, I have a, com a company which is receiving the money for rental income, or I use my company to run the rental business. But when my tenants, they pay over their rental 
um, payment every month, they paid over to my personal account. When I'm going to do the submissions during the end of financial year, then I'm going to struggle because now I wouldn't be able to separate the personal income which received and the business expenses received because now also if SARS could request audit or they say that they want to see my bank statements to prove that I've really received an income, I won't be able to provide it for business. Or also if myself being an individual, I receive certain figures which went to my account and then they request bank statements to prove certain income which I've received. And they see that, but the income which is showing on my personal account, um, I didn't declare on my tax return. Then it will be like I've been under declaring. Whereas is that those incomes which I've received, they fell into or they've they've been paid to my personal account, but I declared them through the business to say that, but I've received so much. So in that way, we request you to at least make a separate bank account so that you don't mix your personal and business expenses or the incomes as well. And then with the invoices until slips, um, what happens normally is that um, we all know that the invoices or till slips fade. So my advice is that please make sure that at least you make copies or scan your invoices so that when they need proof or when SAS says that we need the burden of proof of your supporting documentation, proving your expenses which you've incurred during that specific year of assessment, you are able to provide them with all those invoices or text um, till slips. For business records, you must include all of the following assets, liabilities, overdrawn pro uh, profits, revaluation of fixed assets and loans. The documentary proof are essential to enable you to claim actual expenses in CAT. Expenses may be overlooked unless you record them at the time they are in CAT. To enable you to complete your tax returns accurately, all documents must be kept for a period of five years from the date of submission of the tax return. What is turnover tax? A turnover tax is a simplified system aimed at making it easier for micro businesses to meet their tax obligations. And then also the, the turnover tax, it is also another mechanism where it replaces income tax, it also replaces VAT and provisional tax. Also the capital gains tax inclusive of the dividends tax. For record keeping, you if the record keeping is too much for you, couldn't keep all your Till slips or the information which I've just mentioned, then you look into that. The current system is technically too difficult to comply with, which is of record keeping, costly to hire a tax practitioner to meet the requirements of the current tax system. If a business is in a assess loss situation, it may be better to stay in the current tax system. And then also what you need to know, for you to register for turnover tax, you need to go to SAS website, and also search for turnover tax and see if you qualify to register for turnover tax because there will be some questions where you have to answer and see if you qualify for turnover tax. Or you can also book an appointment to the branch or any SARS branch nationally, which is the closest to you and see if we'll see if you qualify to register for turnover tax. Turnover tax tax rates, um, between zero and 335, it's 0% of taxable turnover. Between 335,000 and 1 rand to 500,000, it's 1% of taxable turnover. 500,000 and 1 rand to 750,000, your taxable turnover, it will be at 2% plus the 1,650. 750,000 and above, it's 6,650 plus the 3% of the taxable turnover. On this slide, um, we are just showing you the difference of the benefits or the comparison between other nature of, of companies or businesses to say that if you are a sole trader and then you've made, let's say for argument, say 338,000, what will be your tax bracket on that specific year of assessment? So you'll be taxed at 31%. And then on the 10 over tax, and then you've made, let's say that uh, 500,000, you'll be taxed at 2% plus 1,650. 
whether as self-employed individuals or businesses, you are required to register your business with staffs, file your tax returns, and pay required taxes on time. The tax return submission period per tax type, tax type company income tax, submission once a year as per company's financial year end, and then the tax return is, we call it ITR 14. The company has 12 months to submit ITR 14 after the financial year end. The financial year end is indicated on the company registration certificate from CIPC. And then even if the company is not yet trading or it haven't made any income, it doesn't mean that you have to notify sales that your company haven't been making any income. You need to also submit your zero return because if you don't submit your company income tax return, you will be penalized 250 per return for that specific case which you didn't submit your company income tax returns. On the personal income tax return for self-employed individuals, once a year announced by SARS during SARS commissioner during the filing season, our tax return, it will be ITR 12 return. It's for sole traders, self-employed and individuals in a partnership should declare their business income on their ITR 12 return. We also have other tax types, which is VAT, value added tax, every two months before the 25th of each and every month, or as per your um, payment period or submission period. And then the return is VAT 201 return. The period will be allocated at the registration, and some companies may be required to submit every month. So it's as per the nature of your business, or as it will be notified when you're registering or your VAT. Um, return. Uh, the pays you end monthly on or after the 7th of each and every month, the return is MP201. The submission is due within seven days after the month the tax was deducted from your employees. And then what you need to know with the pays you earn, even if um, some they've registered with, with SARS through pays you earn, they are deducting UIF from their employees because with UIF is compulsory to deduct. Instead of paying your UIF through Department of Labor, because you'll be submitting the EMP 201 every month. So what you can do, you can submit your 201 and make a payment of UIF through SARS, then SARS will pay over to the Department of Labor so that you don't do double charges between the two because some you find that they've already showed that they've deducted taxes of, I mean, UIF for their employees, and then it is shown or they've paid it over to Department of Labor. Coming to SARS, when they submit the EMP 201, they also show that they've deducted UIF and then they don't pay UIF, they only will focus on pays we earn. For those ones whose uh, the tre tax threshold is above 91,250, then you will have the burden to say that, but you still owe SARS a UIF a payment. So instead of showing it, if you've been paying it over to Department of Labor, rather not show, the UIF on your EMP 201 and correct and make be and be able to show because now what you need to know is that if you've overpaid or you've made double payments for those specific months, SARS is not going to refund you the UIF payments which you've been making over to SARS. And then what you will need to do, you need to go and talk to Department of Labor or consult with Department of Labor regarding the overpayments which you've made. The provisional tax is twice in a year, as I've mentioned, 31st of August and or 28th or 29th of February each and every year. If you top up, then it will be in on the 30th of September. For companies, the first submission is due six months from the start of your financial year. Let's say with the companies, you've just registered your company, let's say now in November. Then coming next year, end of February, you need to submit your provisional tax return. Even if your company haven't made anything, please submit your zero return just to notify SARS that you haven't made any income. The second submission is due at the end of financial year. For individuals, the first submission is due on 30 August and second submission is due 28 or 29 February each and every year. Turnover tax is once in a year. 
the text form it's TT01, 10 over text 03. The submission of the 10 over returns is done once a year in line with the company's financial year end or submission of the annual income tax returns between 1st July and 31st January of the following year of following year for individuals. And then we also have employer reconciliations end of October which will be 30th of October, but on those days or on those dates, all the, the submission dates, if it's at the end of that specific month, which you've mentioned, whether it's 30 August or 31st August, and then 30 October, at the end of October, if the month end of, of that specific month falls on a Saturday or Sunday, then you need to make your submission on a Friday, because if you submit on a Saturday or Sunday, at the end of that specific month, then SARS will impose penalties on you to say that you submitted your tax return late. On the employer reconciliations, we talk of EMP2, EMP501. EMP501 is a compilation of the pays you earn monthly returns, which are EMP201s. So we compile all the information which you've submitted between March and February and show us how much you've the tax withheld, um, you've withheld from your employees and paid it over to SARS. The first interim submission is due at the end of October, and then the final submission is end of May. For any related queries or submission for supporting documents, please use the following channels. You go to SARS website. On the SARS landing page, as you scroll down, you'll find uh, some several buttons. I think there are four or five. You look at the one which says online services, and then you'll get multiple buttons, and then you look the one which says supporting documents. If you need to request your own text number as well, which you'll receive through SMS, you can use the online services button. You request your text number, and then you'll receive it through uh, an SMS. And then with the supporting documentation one, let's say SARS has requested documents from you uh, for the reasons of audit. And you find that your documents are large, which when you submit them through e-filing, e-filing cannot contain all of them. With the submit supporting documentation channel, which is on SARS website, it allows you to submit, I think it's more than 10 times, so you can submit multiple batches but it still allows you to submit as many documents as you can. Remember to use our digital channels. We've made it easier for you to go digital, register for e-filing via SARS e-filing and SARS online query system via sars.gov.za. If you register yourself on SARS e-filing, um, practically what it does, if your information or you haven't updated your details with us, let's say you've changed your contact number, you register yourself on e-filing on SARS website. And then after the registration, SARS will request you sub to submit your documentation of proof of what they require, which will normally be your selfie, where you took a picture of yourself holding your ID or ID card, we also request you to submit your ID book or ID card or passport, and then you load it to SARS. They'll also request three months bank statement inclusive of proof of address. So you can use that channel on how to load your supporting documents on SARS website and load it on so that your e-filing profile can be activated. But if you come to across the glitches when you do your e-filing registration, what you can do as well, you can book, um, an appointment through the branch where you make an appointment so that you can get assistance through e-filing. But through nationally, there are some offices which they have the e-filing guys, um, which are the e-filing supporters, or you can look for SARS pop up branches in the malls, then you can get assistance. Visit and follow us on social media platforms. We have LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. For more information, visit um, SME web page on SARS website. This can be accessed on the landing page. And then also for any information you, which you need, because I know that I filled with more information, you can go to SARS website. On the search button, you can just type in to say, guide on 10 over tax, guide on provisional tax, guide on individual taxes, or guide on company taxes. That's where you'll get your more information on. SARS YouTube channel, you can go to www.youtube.com backslash SARS TV. 
Thank you. I'll hand it over to Marinda Thompson. Thank you, Nanele. Um, um, good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is, um, my name is Marinda Thompson and I'm from the estate segment. And I will take you through this presentation today and talk a little about uh, the information that you, um, how to deal with an estate at SARS. So uh, please just note, we do not give legal advice, but we will provide you with the steps to follow um, on how to report the estate. Uh, we will have a look today at um, an overview, how to report the deceased estate, updating of the registered representative details, the submission of the returns, income tax assessment, the second registration, insolvent estate, deceased estate compliance letters, as well as additional information on our SARS website, and then how to go digital. So please note, so when a taxpayer dies, all of these assets on the date of death will be placed in an estate. And that will mean that we can include in your estate any immovable property, movable property or cash in the bank. The master of the High Court regulates the administration of the estate's process and SAS is merely a creditor in the administration of estate's process. And then you, uh, SAS will submit the claims for the purpose of the liquidation and the distribution account. And then also remember that CGT at the date of death, it they could be possible uh, CGT uh, as a deemed disposal, and therefore we have to include the CGT uh, calculation in your last assessment. So when we um, have a look at the representatives, taxpayers often in state, that means uh, for an executor, it's at the, at the death. For an insolvent estate, it's the trustee and a liquidator that, that deals with the liquidated companies. Then we've got our uh, channels to report an estate. So please make sure that you make an appointment before you visit the SARS branch. For tax practitioners, uh, the email address that can be used is pcc at sars.gov.za. For all other taxpayers, you can use the contact us email address. And then also on the SARS website, as our uh, previous presenter um, showed us, the, you can um, go on digital and use this report new estate case um, to report the estate. So how do you go about uh, to do this and what documents do you need to submit when you um, inform SARS of the death? So we will need a copy of the death notice of the deceased that was issued by the master's office. We will, um, you will have to submit this with a copy of the letter of executorship as well as a copy, a copy of the letter of authority when the estate was less than 250,000. Um, please also send us the inventory that was done at date of death, the last will and testament of the deceased, the name and the physical address, um, email address and the telephone number of the executor or the agent that was appointed. And uh, remember in the case of an agent, a power of attorney is needed with the um, ID document of that appointed um, agent. Then we also will have to, uh, you have to send as the final liquidation and distribution account as soon as it comes, uh, becomes available, as well as the REF 267, our estate duty return. So when we update the registered representative details, um, the role of the representative details is very important because um, this representative, uh, rep representative is the executor that was appointed by the master and he needs to submit all the outstanding returns up to the date of death of the deceased and submit all the relevant estate documents. All representative taxpayers must ensure that their own personal um, um, information on their tax profile is up to date and reflects the correct contact details and email address. Because remember, you are now the representative taxpayer 
and we will do the, we will SAS will correspond with you um, and therefore you need to make sure that your contact details are 100% um, updated. So how do you become a registered representative? The nominated representative taxpayer of the estate needs to ensure that the necessary official appointment documents are finished to SARS for the detail regarding the estate representative taxpayer to be updated. These documents will be then in the case of the section 18.3, the letter of authority and the letter of executorship in a case of the normal estates. So it's a vital important, it's vitally important in the course of the estate um, initiation that the uh, finalization process as all the communication regarding tax inquiries, uh, e-filing matters and the estate compliance and sent to the correct email addresses at SARS. So if we look at the submission of tax returns, so when must the return be submitted? for a deceased person all the required outstanding document uh, returns up to the date of death needs to be submitted for the deceased estate if there was taxable income and after the date of death that means you maybe had some um, capital in a bank and now you are earning interest while the executor is finalizing the estate or maybe rental income that is, um, the, when you uh, earn that income after the date of death, it means there must be a second registration that needs to be opened. And then all the required uh, documents need to be submitted until the l &D is finalized and the case is then deregistered. De so the original liquidation and distribution account must be submitted to the master's office. And then this, when you do that, you must send us a copy of the um, l and account and to, to, together with the REF 267, SARS will then conduct an audit on that l and account. And then um, after all the liabilities have been paid in full, then the executor can request the deceased estate compliance letter. And then this letter will then be sent, sent to, to the um, executor where he needs to submit it to the master's office. And we will only issue one deceased estate compliance letter, including estate duty. How do you submit the tax returns? The income tax ITR 12 can be completed and submitted through any of the following channels, either via the e-filing. So if the deceased estate is not registered for e-filing, the registered representative might proceed to the e-filing website to register for e-filing and then if any assistance is needed, um, please book an appointment at the SARS um, to visit the SARS branch or to um, have a telephonic um, conversation with the um, consultants. Or you can make an appointment at the SARS um, branch. So if we look at the income tax assessment, upon the death of an individual taxpayer, there are two types of um, assessments. So we've got the pre-death assessment, that is for the, um, uh, the, uh, the assessment for income tax deductions applicable to the taxpayer up until the, the date of death. And then for the post-death assessment, that means it's for income, like the interest income that you earn while the executor is finalizing the estate, then that um, income and deductions applicable in the deceased estate after the date of death. So uh, individuals who have passed away on or after the 1st of March 2016, a second income tax reference number is required if the taxable income earned in that deceased estate. Please remember, if you do not receive interest uh, uh, um, in income after the date of death, it's not necessary to actually um, open that um, second registration. If we look at the second registration then, for the deceased estate, a second tax reference number becomes applicable when the income received after the date of death. This tax reference number should only be registered um, when the pre, uh, registered representative can prove there was taxable income after the date of um, uh, death. If the first tax reference number is not coded as a deceased and the status is active, the second tax reference number cannot be issued and then the coding uh, of the deceased taxpayer as an estate must be done via the um, available channels. 
the deceased estate is liable for any tax uh, applicable to income earned during the advertisement period up until the date of the approval of the liquidation and distribution account by the master. Any income earned during the advertisement period uh, um, up to the approval of the L&D account, um, this income and expenditure uh, will have to be um, informed that the beneficiary needs to declare such income in their respective returns. If we quickly have a look on insolvent estates, this means that um, the individual that are um, declared insolvent are sequestrated and dealt, uh, dealt with under the provisions of the Insolvency Act. The effect of the sequestration is that the insolvent person is divested of his or her estate, which is vested then in the master until the trustee has been appointed. Upon the appointment of the trustee, the estates vest in the trustee. So we will have a look at three different taxpayers uh, when we deal with the insolvent estate. So the insolvent person for the period before sequestration, that is our first taxpayer. Then you get the insolvent estate, that is income that was earned after um, the date of insolvency while the trustee is finalizing the estate. And then the first that the third taxpayer is very important. The moment you um, report your insolvent estate, the day after that, you need to go forward with a new tax reference number. And that is the third taxpayer that we refer to. So you will use this new number then after the date of sequestration. If we look at um, deceased estate compliance letter, the executor can request the deceased estate compliance letter via the email addresses that's available. And then this DEC letter must be requested when all the assessments has been finalized, finalized and then when the account is has got the null balance. The DEC cannot be requested when the case has been reported as an estate because there's a few steps that needs to be finalized before we can issue this final um, deceased estate a letter. SARS will issue only one DEC letter, including estate duty, and then the executor needs to submit it to the master's office. Please note, we've got this additional information. So when you go to the SARS website, we've got the um, estate um, tile or uh, icon. Then uh, as soon as you open the estate icon, you will get this administration of deceased estate leaflet. On this leaflet, we um, take you through the steps that needs to be done at the master's office, as well as the steps that needs to take place at SARS. And we've got also the FAQ that's available on the SARS website, on the CSD states and on estate duty. And we give you also a, a detailed um, uh, channel that we you can report the estate and also then a FAQ for the supporting documents that needs to be submitted um, to report the estate case. And also, as Nanelli said, please visit the website for our digital channels that is available and the social media platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. From my side, I think this is, uh, I'm done. And now I will give over to the program director. Thank you, program director. Thank you so much, uh, Marinda, and thank you so much to you, Nanile, for the informative presentation that, that you just shared with us. And um, it's, uh, I would like to believe that um, our taxpayers are getting educated on how to make sure that they comply well, we're making it easy for them to comply. Um, Nanile touched on um, the principles around the gross income where she spoke about your worldwide income that we will be taxing. She spoke about um, different mechanism that can also assist you to relieve you of uh, the tax burden at the end of the tax year, where she made reference to provisional tax. Ladies and gentlemen, provisional tax is there to assist you or maybe to uh, make a provisions for you to have more of a savings put aside uh, to cover your taxes, should you owe uh, your taxes at the end of the tax year. 
Uh, so it's very important that um, when you are receiving income that is not taxed anywhere else, then you rather than submit your RP6, that is a return for the provisional tax, so that you can start being um, 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 making provision for your taxes. Marinda has touched on different types of estate that uh, you can find yourself in. Um, your loved one can pass on and um, you will need to engage on a deceased estate process or you can find yourself in insolvent, then you also have to know the process that you need to follow with regards to, to those two. Thank you so much, ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, remember, you can continue sending through your question on our Q&A chat box. Colleagues kindly assist in responding to those questions. And also we have our social medias that you can still make comments or also interact. Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, hashtag your tax matters. So without wasting more time, ladies and gentlemen, let me continue by calling upon Puti Mpai, who's going to be taking us through the debt management process. Over to you, Puti. All right. Uh, I suppose it's still in the morning. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Program Director. Uh, my name is Putin Pai uh, from SARS as well, a division called uh, Specialized Debt and Outstanding Returns. I'm responsible for automated debt. So today I'll be sharing with you uh, presentation around debt management and the processes that we follow. Uh, as my colleagues have already explained, uh, SARS has a vision to build a smart, modern SARS with unquestionable integrity, a SARS that is trusted and admired by government, the public, as well as our international peers. And we focus on the five uh, strategic pillars out of uh, nine uh, relevant to this presentation. First and foremost, uh, we want to make it easy and simple for our taxpayers out there to comply. Uh, we have to create awareness, clarify issues and create uncertainty uh, insofar as what your obligations are so that you know exactly how you're supposed to comply. And in doing so, we then modernize our systems to provide seamless online and digital services. And we work with and through stakeholders to improve tax system. Now, in the midst of doing these things, uh, for those that still find it difficult to comply deliberately, so then we, we have no choice but to make it hard. Uh, for those that do not comply so that uh, we change the pattern of compliance from enforcement compliance to what we call voluntary compliance, which is what we always aim for. Now, these are the things that I'm going to share with you, basically explain to you who we are as debt management, what we do, the types of taxes that we collect, the process that we follow insofar as collecting that particular debt, and the remedies that are available, as well as recourse for both uh, SARS and most importantly for the taxpayer. And then we'll obviously come to a conclusion. And hopefully with that, through our Q&A, we would have asked questions uh, that we are able to answer. Now, uh, debt management is an integral part of SARS uh, in the enforcement division that deals primarily with uh, following up on outstanding uh, and overdue debt uh, from all tax types. That also includes outstanding returns. We are also responsible for account maintenance functions as SARS. And uh, we have an obligation to collect only the amounts that are due, nothing less, nothing more. Now, these are the types of taxes that we collect, uh, personal income tax, for individuals, that would also include provisional tax, as my colleague Nanila was explaining, company income tax for entities, 
That would also include provisional tax, as was explained previously, admin penalties, which we impose as a result of non-submission of tax returns, as uh, my colleague Manila was explaining, which vary from 250 per tax return per month up to 16,000 per tax return per month, which is on a sliding scale. And then we also are responsible for the collection of outstanding value added tax for individuals and those entities. We also collect pairs N for salaried individuals through their employers, as well as any other uh, pairs N that is collected on any other source of income that is taxed. And then we also collect uh, dividends tax, also known as standard tax on companies. For those dividends that companies uh, declare to their directors as well as shareholders, uh, donations tax for any donations that are made, customs and excise duties for both income and exports as we take goods outside the country or we come with goods that we have purchased from other countries. And then we also collect SDL, which is Skills Development Levy, an unemployment insurance fund on behalf of the Department of Labor. Now, uh, this is the process that debt management follows. Prior to uh, this, you would know that those of you, and I hope all of you do use uh, e-filing to file your tax returns. You would note that as you submit your tax returns on e-filing, you click uh, file. Within six, six seconds, there's a pop-up screen that uh, has the following message, notice of uh, assessment issued slash IT34 issued. Click here to view the notice. So when you click there, as you click to view the notice, and in most cases, most of you are hoping that it's, it's that minus in red, so that you can get your money or your refund within uh, two days, 48 hours. There's a number of things that happen. One of those things that happen, there's an SMS that comes through the cell phone number that you have provided to us. There's also an email that comes through to the email address that we have provided to us. So that is the first part of communication that we do to uh, the, the, the taxpayers to ensure that you are informed in terms of uh, the status of your tax account. So with, with that, and if it's a refund, the, the, the story ends there because we pay your refund. But now obviously in debt management, we'll focus on debt that is due or overdue, which has not been paid. And uh, as a result of that, what would then happen is that if we do not receive any response from you after those SMSs and emails, then we'll usually make a, a phone call or a voice note call where we then inform you about the debt that is outstanding. And then we would then politely ask you to pay the, the debt so that uh, your taxes are up to date. So in, in other instances, the, the payments get done in full or in other instances, a person would then ask for or payment arrangements due to the fact that he or she is not able to make uh, the full payment due to their maybe difficult financial position. So we are amenable to looking at your payment arrangements and then uh, see if we can give you suitable and affordable payment arrangements. Because as SARS, we are not in the business of creating undue financial hardships, especially as a state institution, we shouldn't be doing that. Now, where we make a phone call, it's either you promise to pay or you, 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 you don't promise to pay or you don't uh, cooperate. We then send you what we call a final uh, reminder, which would then tell you about the SMSs and the phone call that, that we made to you previously. And then if you still don't respond to that, then we have what we call a final demand. We issue a final demand. This final demand has got a very, very important message on it. It would go like this. A failure to comply with this notice would lead to SARS appointing a third party that holds funds on behalf of you as a SARS data for that third party to pay the funds over to SARS in terms of section 179.1, 
of the Tax Administration Act. In a layman's term, that third party appointment is what people refer to as SARS garnishing orders, stop orders, debit orders. And that third party can be anybody from an employer to a bank to a convincing attorney or a, even a, an investment institution like Liberty Life or any other institution where you would have uh, made investments or any interest and so forth. So that's basically what we do. And this, this individuals that have been appointed in terms of section 179 one, they've got a legal obligation to actually comply with the notice from SARS. So let's say hypothetically, as we do that, uh, there is no money from either of the third parties that we would have appointed. There's a simultaneous process that takes place. We use what we call our third party data collection systems, uh, AKA our business intelligence systems to now put you under the spotlight and look at you from a best eye view to say, this individual, what does he or she possess in terms of any other assets apart from what we have in terms of the bank accounts or the employer and whatever, what have you. What that means is that we would, we would use natives, we would use deeds and other mechanisms to see if you've got assets, either movable or immovable assets that we can attach to satisfy the debt that you owe. So at any given point in time, up to this level, a taxpayer is still allowed to do the following. You are still allowed to interact with SARS to request for a suitable payment arrangement. You are still allowed to uh, lodge a dispute where you do not agree with the figures or the assessment or the audit that we have conducted. Or alternatively, uh, you can also uh, apply for what we call a settlement or a compromise or a business rescue. Now, if none of those things would have happened at this point in time, uh, we would then move on to what we call a civil judgment by default. At that point in time, we have that information as I've just explained in terms of the assets that you possess. The purpose of that is to attach some of those assets. Obviously, we start with the movable assets uh, that would refer to the boats, to the jet liars, to the beautiful vehicles, to the beautiful furniture, to the beautiful jewelry that you have in satisfaction of the debt. And with that, uh, hoping to settle the debt in full. Even at this stage, you are still allowed to lodge a dispute slash an objection, apply for uh, payment arrangements, albeit under extremely difficult circumstances where we would ask you to provide us with a security so that if you default on the payment arrangements that you would have made with us, we then pursue to dispose of the security that would have provided to us in satisfaction of the debt. Now, if none of those happens, obviously, then we will be issuing a writ of execution, the process that would also involve the sheriff and so forth, and an auction would then proceed where we sell these goods, as I've explained in that particular order, movable assets first, and if those do not satisfy the full debt, then we move on to the movable immovable assets, which are commonly known as properties such as a house or a building that you use for whatever. Uh, that would also include a studio, if the studio is yours. So we will then dispose of those properties in satisfaction of a debt. Uh, now, I want to highlight something also very, very important. Whenever you apply for a dispute or an objection, 
simultaneously you are also supposed to apply for what we call suspension of payment. What is the reason for that? If you do not apply for suspension of payment simultaneously with a dispute, SARS is still entitled uh, to pursue the payment of that debt from you. So if you apply for suspension of payment, then we will put the uh, follow up in terms of the, 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 the payment of the debt in abeyance so that we then preside over your dispute and only when the dispute has been completed. That is then that will, if it's completed in your favor, obviously you don't owe us anything, but if it's not completed in your favor, then that's when we then resume the, the, the follow-up in terms of you making the payment. Remember the whole idea is to try and uh, reduce the number of inventory that we have from a debt management point of view. So the purpose is to try and finalize as many cases as possible, either by way of payment or by way of correction of an account, as I've already explained that amongst the things that we do is to manage the account maintenance functionality to ensure that only the amount that is due and payable to SARS is paid and nothing else. Now, uh, some of the issues I'm going to repeat because I've already explained the issues around uh, the compromise and the settlement and, 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 and whatever, but this is important. That's why earlier on I spoke about the email as well as uh, the, the, the cell phone number. This is what happens. It's important that all of us provide SARS with the correct contact details. In actual fact, it has been legislated in terms of section 23 of the tax administration act. All of us have an obligation, a legal obligation to submit, submit to SARS the correct contact details within 21 days of having changed those details. Failure to do that is actually a criminal offense, but added to that, we are also able to impose penalties uh, for, for not providing SARS with the correct address. So it's very, very important that we update our contact details with SARS so that you are able to get the information timely and you're also able to respond to the correspondence that comes from SARS timelessly. Now, uh, provisional tax payments, end of February and August, mostly for individuals and different financially and mostly for companies. This is what uh, uh, my colleague Nalile was explaining. So we're just reiterating the importance of paying provisional tax on time because if you pay provisional tax on time, you actually make it a little bit easier when you're going to file your tax return because you would have already made provision for tax. So chances are it's either you'll break even with SARS or you'll have a shortfall, which you are always able to, to make up for with the third voluntary provisional tax as was explained by my colleague Nanile earlier on. But as I've already said, it's also important that where you are struggling financially, you should apply for a payment arrangements where we are able to come to an agreement in terms of a suitable and an affordable payment arrangements that does not create a due financial hardship for you. And we are always willing to look at reasonable payments. We can go up to 36 months based on your financial position and your ability to repay at that rate. And it, it's either you do it by making an appointment coming to the office or by email, you will see just in the next slide, there are the email addresses which you can use uh, to, to, to actually apply for that. You can also go on e-filing and then apply for payment arrangement without having to, 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 to come to the office at the comfort of your home or through the SARS mobile, or you can even do that through the SARS contact center. And then you can also apply for a compromise or a settlement of debt when facing legitimate financial constraints. Let me give you a practical example. Let's say you, you, you used to uh, run a successful business or you used to, to, to be employed and earning a good salary and then you get retrenched or the business has gone under because of COVID or whatever uh, the reasons. And, and, and as a result, your current financial position, even if you wanted to pay SARS, you are not in a position to pay SARS. Maybe you, are, you owe SARS 400,000, you only have 270,000. 
to pay SARS. What should then happen is that you, you should uh, apply for a compromise or settlement whereby you then give us your full financial disclosure and explain as to why you are only able to pay 270,000 instead of 400,000 as a full and final settlement or compromise amount. Or if, if it's a business, you can also apply for a business rescue where you then indicate to us that, look, you have gone through serious financial hardships, the business is about to go under, but there is good prospects that the business will, will survive uh, the, the difficult period. But most importantly, going forward, you will be able to comply with SARS fully, one. And secondly, you're also able to indicate the, 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 the economic activities that the business actually uh, conducts in that particular area. Uh, economic activities would go like, for instance, uh, employees uh, that are employed, you create employment around that environment, and as a result, you actually do create good economic activities around that. Going forward, you are able to uh, uh, comply with SARS fully, and uh, you see prospects of the business, and then you, you, you give us forecasts and, and predictions and all, all those things. But most importantly, it, it should always be in the best interest of SARS that we take that compromise settlement or business rescue. So those are just some, some of the remedies that are there. But added to that, remember with admin penalties, you are also able to apply for what we call, uh, uh, I think Nanile has highlighted that, uh, RFR, request for revision, request for remission, uh, request for revisal. Basically what you do is you submit all the tax returns that are outstanding to stop further imposition of admin penalties. And then whilst you edit, you then apply for an RFR where you, you, you bargain with SARS in terms of asking that we reverse part of the penalties or the total uh, penalties and you provide your own reasons that would have made you uh, not to submit the, the tax returns on time. And you can also wait, uh, you know apply for waiver of normal uh, late uh, submission, which have resulted in uh, penalties or interest being imposed. Although we must always remember that interest is a statutory levy, so it becomes a little bit difficult to impose unless uh, you've got more than sufficient grounds upon which you are able to advance to SARS as to why interest should be reversed. But you can always apply for waiver of penalties and provide reasons that are sufficient as to why you believe SARS should be lenient and, and, and then waive uh, the penalties. Now, as I, I've already explained earlier on, these are the email addresses that you can uh, send for application of uh, payment arrangements, uh, suspension of payment, or any, any issue that is debt related. And, and these this emails are for all the nine uh, provinces in, in our country and all the offices that are available. They look into this email uh, quite, uh, emails quite regularly and so forth. And need I also make mention of the fact that uh, when you apply for uh, payment arrangements, we should be able to respond to you in two weeks time, which should give us sufficient time to deal with perusing the documents that we have forwarded to us in support of your financial position that only allows you to pay a certain amount as opposed to pay the full amount. So uh, to answer your question, uh, because I think I've seen a question where people were asking, how long does it take for SARS or should it take for SARS to respond? Two weeks should be sufficient for us to be able to respond with an answer or either to request further information when we still need clarity on these things. Uh, in conclusion, we just like to reiterate the fact that SARS is a state organ that has been mandated to collect revenue on behalf of the state and ensure that every citizen pays only what is due to the state. And, and added to that, uh, we always function as SARS within the parameters of the Income Tax Act and the Tax Administration Act and related legislation. And our actions and decisions are always and solely guided by this legislative requirements. By implication, what that means is every action that we take, there's very, very little room for the commissioner to be arbitrary. So we have to understand that 
even if it's not this particular SARS official that is interacting with you at that point in time, any other person who was tasked with that responsibility would do exactly the same thing because we are guided by this uh, important legislative requirements. Uh, I suppose uh, because we've got a Q&A block where you are able to ask these questions, you'll continue to flood us with questions so that you are able to then uh, answer those questions and create more clarity to you so that by the time you leave here, you, you have clarity in terms of what is expected of you, but most importantly, how you should go about doing these things. So at this point in time, I would like to thank you all for having given me an opportunity to present and also to allow my colleague, uh, Mr. Nicholas Namalili, to then take the, the matter forward. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mbai and uh, my colleagues for uh, excellent presentation. My name is Nicholas uh, Nemariri. I am from Voluntary Disclosure Program of SARS. Um, I am here today to present um, uh, about or to talk to you about the program itself. So um, as my colleagues have already indicated uh, that we have a vision as SARS, uh, vision 2024, our, our vision is about building a smart modern SARS with unquestionable integrity, trusted and admired by government, the public, as well as our international peers. And therefore the purpose of this presentation really is to align or to talk, or, or, or it's mainly focused on our, our strategic objectives, uh, mainly to make it easier for you to comply and to also make it as simple as possible for you to comply. Uh, you would remember, um, Dr. Radiran mentioned that we have a compliance theory, and uh, that is we believe that majority of our taxpayers out there want to comply. Um, as such, we must be able to make it very easy for you to comply and also to provide you with clarity and certainty. So that is the purpose of this presentation that I'm going to take you through. So these are the points that I'm going to cover in my, in my presentation. I'm going to talk about the objectives of the program. I'm talking about the voluntary disclosure program and what are the benefits thereof of the program itself? I mean, why should I apply? Why should I consider VDP? Under what circumstances am I supposed to make use of the VDP? Also, I'll talk about who qualifies or rather who may apply. Uh, am I entitled to apply? What are the uh, things that I need to be aware of if I am indeed considering to apply? After that, I will go and talk about the requirements. So what are the requirements? So when you walk out uh, from this session, at least you should be able to know the requirements for your application to be valid. And I will take you through those requirements. And then I will also take you through the process itself. Um, uh, the how do you go about submitting the VDP application following the right channels. And finally, I will give you some takeaways uh, in the form of uh, some tips. Um, I would really want you to take some tips and uh, uh, make use of them uh, in your day-to-day -day running of your business. So VDP, the objective of the VDP it's to provide certainty, as you um, I would have already indicated. So we want to provide certainty to you as a taxpayer. You know, it, it is best for you to worry about your business and not to worry about your past tax defaults. As such, the aim here is to assist you to make sure that you are clean and you should focus on the present and the future and not what happened in the past. So VDP is internationally accepted mechanism that was introduced to provide tax relief. Why are we saying it's internationally accepted? This is because previously tax authorities uh, all over the world, they used to do what is called amnesties. Uh, we had multiple amnesties, for example, in South Africa, but now we no longer talk about amnesty. We talk about this voluntary disclosure program. And this program is a permanent program as opposed to a, a being a temporary arrangement uh, like the uh, amnesty further. This program, it's not limited to a specific industry. It's open to all South African taxpayers with a tax defaults. 
and 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 who wants to regularize those uh, text uh, text defaults and we cover the whole lot of text types um you may be thinking of vet income tax uh, psn sdl all those text types are covered under this vdp program however the text that we do not cover it's customs at the moment so customs it's excluded from voluntary disclosure program but any other tax royalty tax all other tax that you might think of yes are, are covered under the program so what normally happened is when you are conducting a business or when you are uh, 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 in the uh, uh, creation of, uh, of entertainment and all those kind of, uh, of services that you provide to us, you may erroneously miscalculate your tax, isn't it? Or some deliberately so decided to evade from tax in the past. Uh, and, 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 and we have seen a lot of applications coming in from the taxpayers that previously just decided not to comply with tax obligations. However, the program is there to assist those people who really wants to change and comply going forward. So regardless of the trigger of your non-compliance of the past, voluntary disclosure program will be able to assist to make sure that you regularize and then you are part of the tax base. You know, uh, um, there's nothing comforting to know that I am as an individual contributing towards building South Africa. And one way of doing that is by paying that tax. So if for any reason you may have found yourself on the wrong side of the legislations, VDP program is designed to assist you. So what are the benefits? For those who are interested uh, with the Tax Administration Act, if you go to chapter 16 of, of Tax Administration Act, this part A that talks about understatement penalties, then this part B, Part B is dedicated for this program that I'm talking about, voluntary disclosure units. So go to chapter 16, part B, and there you will find a lot of things that I will be talking about today. For example, let's talk about the benefits. Uh, under the VDP uh, uh, program, SARS commits that it will not pursue any criminal prosecution arising from that tax default. So once you bring in that tax default to so show us the tax default, once we agree on that, SARS tomorrow cannot turn and say, you know what, um, by the way, let me uh, um, proceed with the criminal prosecution. Further, uh, SARS commit that it will give you a relief in respect to understatement penalties. You know, um, there are about six behaviors and each behavior comes with its own tax penalty. For example, if you look at, uh, if SARS, determines that the cause of this error that you made was due to reasonable care not taken in completing your return. That only its own care is 25% penalty. And if SARS determines that there are some obstructions and resistance in the process, that escalates to 50%. I'm just talking about reasonable care not taken in completing your return. What about gross negligence? If you go and look at the table under 223 of Tax, uh, uh, tax Administration Act, it talks about gross negligence. If SARS determines that you did not pay your taxes purely because of gross negligence on your part, as a standard case, we're already talking about 100% penalty. And that moves or escalate to 125% if it is shown or if it can be proven that there was some obstruction or if it is a repeated case. Intentional tax evasion, it's another behavior and also comes with its own penalty uh, percentage. It starts at 150%. So if it can be proven by SARS that yes, there was an intention, you suspend the payment of liability knowingly that you owe SARS and knowingly you decided to postpone the tax liability by uh, that not disclosing your income then we're talking about 150% penalty there. That is a standard case. That can escalate to 200% penalty if it is proven that there was, uh, there was an ob obstruction or a repeated case. So here it means if we're taking your house, you're still owing us another house because we're talking about 200% penalty, right? 
but I'm hoping that uh, uh, Mr. Mbai won't do that. But, but, but that's how uh, the, 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 int, the penalty regime work. So if, if, if you make use of the VDP, what happens? SARS commits that it will waive that penalty to 0%, but with the exception of two. We are not going to give you 0% if we can prove that there was a gross negligent, but hit you with 100%, we will only leave you 5%. It's still a win to a, a, a previous non-compliant taxpayer who wishes to comply. And, 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 and if uh, it was uh, intentional tax evasion, for example, we're not gonna, you're not gonna get 150%, but 10% penalty we must impose. Just to say your behavior, it's, it, it's, it's gross and it cannot be, uh, we cannot just allow you to work, to work uh, scot-free. Again, another relief that SARS commit, we are going to grant 100% uh, uh, relief in respect to administrative non-compliance tax uh, uh, penalties. These are penalties that are housed under chapter 15 of your Tax Administration Act, but with the exception of, um, of, of late submission of return. The late submission of return, we do not waive. Why? Because there are other avenues that one can use. There are other avenues that one can use to, uh, 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 um, you had um, Mr. Mbai talking about uh, other avenues where you can uh, present your case. Uh, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Nalile also talked about other avenues that are available that one can use to, 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 to present the case. What caused that late submission? And, and the committee might look into it and say, you know what, let's wait. So for that, we encourage you to make use of the normal processes. Unlike the amnesty, you will still pay your tax debt. If you are owing SARS hundred rent and this hundred rent goes back to 2020, 2020, you will still pay that hundred rent. And you will also pay the interest. So we are not going to waive the interest because you had the benefit of use of that money. SARS was out of the pocket, the fiscal was out of the pocket. So the interest, common, a common law with regard to the interest rules applies. You are still liable for that particular interest. So these are the benefits. And, 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 and it's not, this is just not word of mouth where we are saying we're not gonna pay you. We are going to enter into an agreement, a legal document where you will sign as a party and the commissioner or the senior SARS official will sign to commit that SARS will give you these benefits that I'm talking about. So who may apply? I'm sure you are asking yourself, yes, you've got other ish, past issues that you want to regularize Then the question is, do I qualify? Can I apply? Yes, any individuals can apply. If you've got company or you've got trust or any structure that you may have, you are entitled to apply you can apply for voluntary disclosure program. You know, a person who has been given a notice by our auditors or criminal investigation, unfortunately it's too late for you to make use of the program. So, 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 so the takeaway here is knock at our door before SARS knocks at your door. Because if, if, if you will wait for SARS to knock at your door, uh, unfortunately, you are closing yourself out of this door that we're talking about. Yes, and under a very difficult circumstances or exception, SARS may say, you know what, uh, although you are under audit, the issues that SARS auditors are looking at are pretty much different with what you want to tell VDP, so proceed to apply for VDP. But that does not suspend that audit. That audit will, 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 will continue, and then we will then from the VDP side also continue with our work. I know some of you are asking yourself, what about the records? I want to regularize my uh, previous defaults and they go back 2008 or 2015. I don't have all those proper records. We understand that, but we do not condone it. It is important to maintain records. It is your legal obligation to have the documents that are needed and must be kept for the duration articulated in that legislation. So what happens if you don't have? 
Well, VDP will not throw you your, your, your application out purely because you do not have. We will work with you to come to a reasonable estimate because our idea here is to bring you into the tax net. We understand that you are coming with the aim of complying going forward. So why should we chase you out? So we will assist you to comply. And that will also mean we'll have to work together to come to a reasonable estimate. We had a program, if uh, you allow me to share with you an experience, we had a program, uh, SVDP, Special Voluntary Disclosure uh, Program. You know, that program was open for, it was a temporary program. It was open for everyone to apply. Those who have offshore assets, you know, those who, who have been hiding their assets offshore. So some of them came to the VDP and say, uh, VDP, the intention was never to have any records. The intention was to operate underground. So we will not have any records to prove that we own this much in this island or in this tax haven, but this is what we owe. And starts worked with them to come to a reasonable estimate and they were able to pay their tax dues and they are complying going forward. So this confirmed that SARS will work with all the taxpayers to assist them to comply going forward. So don't say I don't have the records, therefore I must walk away. No, come to VDP and VDP will assist you. Something else, VDP, it's a ring fenced unit within SARS. Meaning whatever you do with SARS VDP, it's only known by those who are within that unit. That information will not be shared with any other parties within SARS. So what does it mean? So it means if, if we do not agree at the end of the process, we say, you know what, we just don't agree here. You will go back to your hiding place where you were and VDP is not going to take that file of yours and give it to our investigators. We believe in our investigators. Our investigators, in due time, they will find you. You, you, you heard what uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Thompson, said. We will still have to deal with you on the estate part, right? So we may delay the process, but we will end up, at, at the end of the day, we will know about you. It is better for you to sort out your issues or your tax affairs now while you are still alive than to, to allow us to sort your tax affairs when you are no longer with us. Because SARS will do that. So VDP is there for you to make use of it. So we are ring fenced. We, 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 we believe that it is a fair deal to you as a taxpayer out there to know that you are engaging SARS VDP knowing very well that your information is protected, it's not going to be used against you in the case where you decide to walk away. Of course, uh, at times you, this is different where you walk away after the agreement, right? Or if you walk away after the assessment has been raised. Because if you walk away after the agreement has been entered into, then it means now SARS has a right as a party to that agreement, as much as you have the right as a party to that agreement to pull out. And when you do that, there are implications. For example, we would have agreed and signed of payment terms that you are committing to pay us this much on month one, month two, month three. And we expect you to, to comply with those uh, uh, terms that we'll have agreed on. And as much as SARS will follow those terms or benefits that we are giving you as a relief. But, but if, you, if, if for some reason you are unable then to, 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 to commit or to follow, to, 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 to do what is expected from you, then it follows that the agreement now becomes null and void. So this, the, the agreement collapse and then we will have to follow the normal process. So what are the requirements? There are about um, six, important requirements. Requirement number one, it talks about a default, but I'm not going to talk about much about default because I've, I've already explained. A default is when, you know, there's an error that you found. There's an error, there's an issue that leads to your tax affairs of the past. So that is why you want to come. So there must be that, right? So you cannot come to VDP to claim your refund. No, 
you will have to follow the normal process. There's no default there, right? But you can come to us and say, you know what, I have, I have flats, I have this, uh, farming operations in the neighboring countries that I have been hiding from you guys, but now it's time to come clean. I've been, I have these flats, uh, a block of flats there in Soweto. Now it's time to, to, to come and, and regularize those. That's a default there, but it must be voluntary. You must not be induced. Like I said, knock before, we knock. Don't wait for SARS to ask you a question to take a phone and say, by the way, I'm looking into your, 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 your rental income here. Uh, please uh, explain to me what is happening. So instead of you explaining that, then you run to VDP. Does it work like that? Because you have been induced, right? It's no longer voluntary. There's something that pushed you. Uh, this terminology, this term voluntary, uh, you, you might think it's, it's, a, it's a very simple term. Very true, it is very simple term. It's not defined in the tax administration act because it's a simple term. You, you, you follow the normal ordinary meaning of the word that you find in the dictionary. But we have been taken to court several times on what voluntary means. This issue has actually reached Supreme Court of South Africa, where the Supreme Court confirmed that that's you are right. Someone must not be pushed. You must not be induced. If someone is pushed, don't give that person a relief because it's no longer voluntary. And there must be a disclosure. And I'll talk about that when I continue, but let's move on to other requirements. So you can come to VDP as many times as you want. You, you, you can come today for income, we'll search out your income, then after a year or two, you can come back and say, by the way, hey, I should have regularized my deductions. I have been overclaimed expenses that actually do not even exist. Please assist us. We will accept you because it's not similar. It's not a similar default, but you cannot come today and say, I, I have not been regularizing my rental income. Yes, VDP SARS will assist you. We regularize it. Then two years down the line, you come back. Still, I have not been uh, complying with my rental income. Starts saying, hold on there. You must wait for five years. Don't come to us with the same or similar default within a period of five years. Okay, I've got a load shedding. Let's hope my network will not drop. Let me continue as I, as I speak to you. So, so again, you know, another requirement is full and complete disclosure. What are we talking about here? You know, we have seen a lot of partial disclosure coming in our way. Someone comes and just give us a small portion, wants to regularize this part and leave the rest. You don't want to disqualify yourself because of disclosing a half information. You rather give us full and complete information so that the evaluator, when they look into a case, when they sign, they are satisfied that they've assisted you, they've provided the necessary clarity, they've made your life easier going forward. But if you give us incomplete information, what will happen is after a year or two or three years, who knows, you might be selected for an audit, right? And then when they are auditing you, then we are able to see the, the, the whatever information that they have there. Because, uh, I mean, if, even though we don't share information, we are able to see whatever information, whatever is happening within SARS. Then we'll say, hold on, this is our previous client. He has been audited for this. We don't know about this income. That may render your application, even though you, we had entered into a VDP agreement. Two years, three years down the line, we you might receive our call to say, by the way, we are aware that you've been audited and these are the issues that have been discovered. And those are the issues that are material that were never shared with us. And as such, we are exercising our right as SARS to withdraw from the agreement, right? So there must be a, a behavior. I've already talked about the behavior. I'm talking about the reasonable cannot take it, intentional tax, gross uh, uh, negligence. Those are the behaviors that causes us to make these defaults, right? So there must be one, and therefore we'll be able to assist you. As I've indicated, your declaration must not result in a refund. So at the end of the day, the 
whatever declaration that you are bringing to us must either do two things. It must reduce your assessed loss. If you had accumulated loss, it must reduce that one, or it must result in you paying SARS. If it doesn't result into these two, then you need to follow the normal process. I've spoken about uh, um, the disclosure of voluntary. The other requirement is that it must be made in the prescribed form and manner. It is pity because we have seen that an individual with good intention wants to make use of the VDP. Unfortunately, that person make use of the wrong door. The person goes and knock at the auditor's door and say, auditors, this is the, my story. And then the auditor will say, thank you, let me audit you. And then you are, then the auditors will impose all those penalties. Why? Because you did not knock at the right door. Or the doctor or, or the, the, the auditor might say, okay, fine, let me make some notes. Let me put this case here. I will look into it after a month or two. Then you hear from someone talking about voluntary disclosure. Then you come to us. But when we check, our preliminary check reveals that actually you had a meeting with an auditor and you were talking about this thing. Unfortunately, because you did not make your application through prescribed form and manner, you are not telling us or you are not telling SARS something that SARS does not know already. A disclosure, it's when you are disclosing something that is not known, isn't it? So, 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 so you cannot disclose something to us that we already know. So it is important that you make your application following the prescribed form and manner. And I will talk about those. What is this prescribed form and manner? By the way, you can actually visit the branch and the branch, our branch uh, our personnel, they know as soon as you tell them that you are here because of the VDP, they know exactly how to assist you in a way that is not just going to disqualify you in the future. So these are the requirements and you will find them under section 227 of, the, uh, of that chapter, uh, chapter 16B that I spoke about. Those are the six important requirements. So let me take you through the process. Um, the main uh, path that one can follow is through e-filing. And we recommend and we encourage you to make use of the e-filing when you are engaging VDP uh, division. So you will put in your VDP there, you will find your VDP 01 form. Um, you've got two options there. One option is if you want to test the water, you are not sure, you don't trust us, you are not even sure about your story. So, so, so you can actually select there and say, you know what, let me test these people first. And then you can do an anonymous. I've seen uh, 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 most of you listened to um, uh, you know, when she was encouraging you to, to be anonymous there on the chat uh, question and answer. So you can actually do the same and uh, make yourself anonymous. Give us a no-name application, we will receive it. And then when we receive it, we are going to evaluate it based on the facts that you would have put in. We will go through your submission. And then once we have made a determination, we will issue you with a formal non-binding ruling to say, based on these facts that you have provided to us, we are of the view that you will qualify for voluntary disclosure unit, uh, for voluntary disclosure program then it's up to you what you do next. You may decide then to make the formal application now. Same form, VDP01, now you no longer hide your identity. That application comes into VDP at SARS, then the evaluator will consider your application. Um, once they are happy, they will accept your application. Once that is done, then the necessary assessments will be uh, raised, uh, liability determined, and then we enter into a VDP agreement where you and ourselves will sign and then the process completes. And we hope that you will continue to, to be that citizen that you always want to be, a citizen that pays their tax dues. Sometimes your application can come and then we find that uh, by the way, you already knocked at the wrong door or you are under audit, you are under any criminal investigation or the issue that you want to regularize us. It's, it's, it's not an old default, it's something, I mean, the debt is already there, the assessments are there. So you are not bringing anything, right? Then we say, you know what, because 
uh, debt is not a, a default, by the way, for purposes of, uh, of VDP. You cannot come for uh, existing debt, right, for purposes of VDP. So we say, you know what? We'll issue you know, we, we go with a formal letter to say we've reviewed your application. Unfortunately, the application does not meet the requirements and uh, we encourage you to make use of the normal SARS process. And the case is closed. So these are the steps that one can take. I indicated when I started that I will share with you some of the tips or takeaways. So, so for those taxpayers who are not even registered, and now you've got this fear that if I go to SARS and register, the system, you heard about what the system does, right? And then the system will just flag me and now I'll be subjected to all these audits and uh, uh, and uh, what, debt, and people will be coming to, to confiscate whatever I have. If you go and apply today for your tax number, whether it's VAT or income tax, and you come to VDP within 21 days from that date of application, VDP will disregard any effort that has been made within SARS. It will disregard all those criminal investigation letters. It will disregard uh, Mr. Empire's letter, the demand letter, and all those things. And then we will still take you in and assist you. That's if you adhere to the timelines. If you want more information on how to complete that VDP-01 form, right, we have an external guide. Uh, and you can access it on the website, right? It's, it's a voluntary disclosure uh, program guide on, on how to, to, to apply. Um, you find that and then it's very straightforward. It will guide you step by step. And then uh, finally, um, as I've indicated, um, you can contact us. Uh, we've got a VDP mailbox there. You can call us on our own toll-free number, our own toll-free number, meaning it's not going to be answered by SARS um, toll free line that you know, this is a specifically, a, this is a line specifically dedicated for VDP. If you want more information, feel free to visit our website, uh, the normal SARS website under VDP, then you can learn a whole lot of things. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope uh, this presentation will, was useful and it will assist you going forward. Wow, thank you so much, Mr. Nicholas, and thank you, a big thank you to uh, Puti as well. Um, I think these two presentations are actually, um, um, they go together. And I think what we're taking out of this is, this, is that SAS is a caring organization. I mean, um, you listen to Puti where he kept on giving you steps to follow in making sure that your texts are in order. And um, uh, he was explaining to you that the key is make sure that you are in contact with SARS. Come and explain yourself to SARS. Don't hide away. Um, he mentioned that if you don't update your contact details, you are an offender. So you need to make sure that when you change your contact details, you inform us of that so SAS can know where to find you. The same way as he did indicate on how to find them if you want or to find us, if you want to talk to us with those different email addresses that we have for different uh, 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 regions, that it, it is easy for you to, to be in contact with us. Uh, he spoke about mechanism that is there for you to make arrangement for your tax debts. Um, and also he make reference to uh, processes that is available for people that are facing financial difficulties. Uh, he mentioned compromise, settlement of those uh, debts that you have, but we can only assist you if you work with us and if you come through. And we wanted to make it easy by having this kind of session that we educate you, that you are equipped enough to know where to go when you are faced with any situation. We're going again to uh, Nicholas Day, where he's telling us about how merciful SARS can be about the voluntary disclosure program. I mean, really, did you listen to him? You know what he said? He said that SARS will not pursue any criminal procedures against you when you come forth. They will grant you a relief in respect of understatement penalties. And you heard those percentages that uh, 
I mean, they go as far as 200%, 200%, and we can relieve you of that. We can try and reduce them somehow. He spoke about 100% relief on administrative non-compliance penalties. But remember, with an exception to the late submission penalties, that one we're saying, Mr. Taxpayer, Ms. Taxpayer, we're giving you enough time to uh, submit your return. I mean, um, as an individual, we all normally open our tax filing season from July and closing up until end of October, or end of November. And in your case as a provisional taxpayer, it even closes in January. So that's enough time. And as a company, or you get uh, 12 months after your financial year end. I think that is accommodative. That is reasonable, ladies and gentlemen. So knock first when you want to utilize the VDP or the voluntary disclosure program. But not only knock at the right door. So uh, knocking first is that you're going to come to us and tell us that you want to join the program. You're going to knock at the right door. The right door is that you're not going to go and speak with our enforcement uh, department. You're going to come to VDP and explain yourself. And then at the right time is before enforcement catches with you because they do catch you and you don't want to find yourself in that situation. With that, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, continue to send your question for clarity, your question for uncertainties uh, via our chat box. I see that colleagues have been answering all your questions. We still have an email address that you can utilize as well. And remember all these questions we are going to put together on a frequently asked question document so that you can always refer back to it. I heard Nicholas saying that he is in uh, load shedding and thank God that he had made plans obviously to, um, uh, to, to make sure that he still stays on. But if for whatever reason you get cut off, we are saving this. Um, we are recording this session. You can always get it on our SAS TV you, you, uh, YouTube and continue to be in contact with us. We have our social uh, uh, media, our Facebook, our Twitter, LinkedIn, a hashtag, your text matters, continue to do that. At this present moment, I would like now to take um, the questions that we have received and try and respond to them. Remember your question help us to test if we are providing you with enough clarity to your tax obligation as per our strategic objective one. Your, question, your questions also assist us to improve our processes and your taxpayer experiences as we are committed to making it easy for all taxpayers and traders to comply with their tax obligation. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to facilitate Q&A session, but I'm not here alone. I do have a panel of experts with me that are going to assist in responding to your question. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to call upon you. And when I do that, I will ask that you switch on your video and you let your video on for the duration of this session. I will start by calling on Puti, Puti from Debt Management. You have met Puti already. Thank you, Puti. Um, I would also like to call upon Marinda from Estate. Thank you, Marinda. And then I would also like to call on uh, Nanile from Tax Base Broadening and Education. Thank you, Nanile. Then I would like to also call upon Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas. Ladies and gentlemen, may I continue? May you, you may continue to send your question on the Q and A chatbot. Uh, the panel will continue responding to them, or rather, use the email address creativeindustryquestions at sas.gov.za. But remember that we said that that email address we are going to close it at the end of this session, and remember not to disclose your personal details. I will start with the question that we received from you here. It says, I have submitted my application for arrangement via the email a month ago. How long does it take for one to receive a response and where do I follow up? 
Okay, this question, I think uh, Putti did touch on it when he was giving his presentation, but uh, for the benefit of those that maybe just join us, I will allow Putti to respond to it again. Putti, over to you. Okay, uh, thanks for the question. I earlier explained that uh, it's supposed to take two weeks for us to respond to these uh, kinds of things because Remember, one of the things that we must bear in mind is that the complexity of the application also determines the duration. What do I mean by that? If a person is a salaried individual, for instance, they earn only a salary, he or she has the income and expenditure. Would it be the salary and then the necessary living expenses? So that's a straightforward uh, matter for, for us to be able to respond to uh, within the shortest possible time. But where we have a business entity which has what we call a tree, a tree would be a number of subsidiaries and a whole lot of things. So we have to have a full picture versus what the person would have provided to us. So in so doing, even in the audit environment, sometimes we, there will be that back and forth where we'd ask for further information before we actually arrive at a decision because we'd have to look at the things that would actually assist us to arrive at a, a, an appropriate decision. So th those will, would be the determining factors in terms of how long we should take. But under normal circumstances, within two weeks, we should be able to deal with that because the first thing is that as soon as the case comes in, we should be able to then allocate it. It may not be the very same person who actually communicated uh, 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 the first part of the communication with you. So someone would have, to, uh, would have to allocate that case to someone who must then respond to a collector who must then respond to that case. But two weeks is the general time frame within which we should be able to respond. Thank you so much, uh, Putti, for that detailed um, response. Uh, the next question is, do we have a direct line for me to register as an executor? If not, share the registration process. Um, I would like to ask Marinda to cover this one. Marinda, over to you. Thank you for the question, Program Director. Now, there's no direct line for the registration for an estate. But you can use the SARS online service on the SARS website for the, for the digital channels to report a new estate for using the email option for the contact us um, at sars.gov.za. Please visit the website also where we have the estate style um, or the icon where you can have more information on how to deal with the estate case. Thank you so much, Marinda. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just remind you that should you exit um, the, uh, the webinar at any point, may I ask that you complete uh, the survey at the end of this that help us um, to see where we can improve and how we can assist you further or educate you further. As I continue, I received my money from the record company under the name, mm -mm -mm, but my name is, Making an example is Dineo Zima, and I did not receive an RP5. What are the tax implications? I would like to ask uh, Nanile to assist us with this question. Nanile, over to you. Okay. Based on that question, um, you would have received an agreement or you could have had an agreement with that recording company. And then on that specific uh, contract, probably they would have mentioned how much you're going to get paid. And then even the money went through to your specific bank account. So when you do your declaration, you need to notify us of how much you've received. If you're battling to do that, you can book an appointment, go to the sales branch, bring in your three months or 12 months bank statement so that you're able to check the amount which you've received from that specific recording company. If it was a once-off amount, you bring us that specific bank statement, also bring us the contract so that you are able to do the assessment based on the amounts which you've received. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Nani. Thank you. Um, the next question is, why is the VDP and how it is different from the amnesty? Um, Nicholas, you covered this extens extensively, but I think it's fitting that you re-emphasize what you have covered. Over to you, Nicholas. 
Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Um, the reason for VDP is that uh, we, we, we want to have a platform or an avenue where we can assist taxpayer at any given time um, to regularize their tax affairs. We should not wait for a particular window period we will be saying now it's time to assist. So VDP is a permanent program designed to assist taxpayer at any given time as and when the defaults occurs. Unlike the amnesty, uh, amnesties are temporary and uh, um, are industry specific, and they are not, uh, they do not benefit every taxpayer. So VDP it's for all taxpayers, uh, South African taxpayers who have default, right? And um, similar to Amnist, we will still grant relief on your penalties. Uh, we will still grant relief in so far as uh, criminal prosecution is, is concerned. So you, 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 it's, it's pretty much the combination of both. Unlike Amnesty that does not appreciate the fact that there are millions of taxpayers out there who comply on a regular basis. So VDP appreciates that. That is why it has some percentage where we can actually impose we would feel that there's a gross negligence or intentional tax evasion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, you can still access this um, uh, uh, presentation that all our presenters has gone through on our website. The SMME has a web page on the SAS web page um, website that you can always refresh your mind on any of this topic. Thank you so much, members of the panel. And thank you so much for continuing responding to the question on our Q&A chat. We will do so, ladies and gentlemen, as well with the emails that we have received. And all those questions will form part of the frequently asked questions um, that you can also access through our, our website. For any escalation or for any interaction that you like to do, SAS has a dedicated service channel for the small, medium, and micro enterprises where you can easily find information to assist you with a tax obliga obligation. So like I mentioned that we have a web page on our SAS website that you can go into and um, uh, see if uh, you find any information that can assist you to make your compliance easy, or you can even call our contact center 0800-007277, and you can choose option six, or you can book an appointment with our web um, on our website and choose the SMME options. I hope that you find clarity from this session and that you find it easy to meet your tax obligation, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, at this point in time, I would like now to, as we are coming close to um, the end of this program, it has been very nice being with you. But before we go on, may I please ask, um, call upon uh, Eugene Mtetra to come and give um, an industry remark with regards to why we are here today as a creative industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't see Eugene coming up. Um, I think it might be, you know, uh, the, the era that we live in, load shedding is, is, you know, is the topic of every day. It's, it's now business as usual, we can call it that. Maybe we might have lost Eugene along the way, but don't despair. Um, I'm gonna now give over to Professor Reboni uh, Tabo, who's going to give us the closing remark. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Program Di uh, Director Dineo, for doing a sterling job. I am so, so, so delighted that we had this session today. I, um, I know Eugene is not available, but I just want to take you through the journey in which we engaged as a SARS with the industry when we hear a call for action we respond. This session has been made possible by a request from the industry to say, we'd really like SARS to assist us in providing clarity and certainty to our members so that they know their obligation. And to also know about SARS processes, how to do and interact with SARS without fear. And then what we did through different engagements, we finally end up today. We know it's December time, 
but we also thought it is worthwhile for us to engage with you. More importantly, to create spaces for information exchange and to get feedback from you on the experience we are offering. I must say that you might feel like it's been daunting to receive such information, but the most important thing is it's a, the, the topic we chose were quite important, were based on the needs that we received from you, and we provided general legislation principles, we offered estate processes, we also offered you insights about debt management process, and also the voluntary disclosure program. If you look at all this topic, we're carefully selected to really provide you with feedback on the key issues that we normally get as questions from the industry. And we hope that you are going to use these insights and also this recording to consistently refer back to them because they offer you with all the necessary information you need, especially to assist you to come to SARS. And as everybody said, SARS believe that you want to do the right thing. You want to comply. And therefore our goal is to insist on you not fearing SARS, but approaching SARS. As we aspire and work towards achieving our smart modern SARS, will continue to make it easy for you to come and understand and know your obligation. And because what is important for us is because you matter. Our sense and data suggest that there is appetite for more conversation, which we really, really appreciate. And these sessions will continue to come to you because at the end of the day, we don't want you to come to us. We don't want you to come to our branches, but we want to have a platform where we can always interact because you matter. Let me pause and take this moment to thank the following who have made it possible for us to achieve our objectives today. Yesterday, I received a note from the commissioner saying, hang on a second, is it not December? Why are we doing this session only now in December? And I said, it was the industry that requested this and we will deliver on it. Thank you team for making sure that it happens. To the organizing team, my goodness, even in December as people close, you set your steadfast on this, you want to do it and you did it. Thank you to everybody who was involved, the stakeholders in this team, the SMME, the trade education, all the stakeholders in operations, the media, communication and IT who made the stage for us all. Together, we always get further. To all my presenters, my goodness, the chair, the Q&A team, the presenters were really on fire in educating all of us. I learned also a thing or two. I always thought I understand, but today, oops, our VDP, Mr. Nicholas was on fire. Thank you all for making it possible. And lastly to you, the participants. I know it has been a long session, but we are comforted by the fact that this session will be available on YouTube. Go on, reflect on it, send us emails, send us communicate with SARS. We don't want you to be fearful of SARS, but we want to, you to be our partner. Be assured that you are part of our ecosystem and therefore a very important partner. And in conclusion, as SAS, we continue to enhance relationship with our taxpayers, relationship based on cooperation in order to achieve the level highest of it, of clarity and certainty, especially voluntary tax compliance. I had our, our Nicholas explaining what is voluntary. Yo, we even go to that level. It's amazing. We use webinars as one of our connection boosting opportunity to get wider reach. Please share this with others so that we can be able to make sure the wider sense of our community, your community, get to understand Texas a little bit. We know it's a little bit difficult, but try to be an advocate as well. Now do you receive this information to share this with other people because the more you share, the more we all find that you are becoming clever and wiser with your tax matters. We'll continue to monitor the impact of our work to ensure that we bring 
every every time the needs that you you require for us to educate on however we would still like you to give us feedback as you navigate our digital self service platform using valuable information available remember to always provide information provide feedback because we want to hear from you and we want you to always always not fear us in in the coming month the question would be what is next in the coming months, we'll be hosting the webinars, for example, Trust. And please, again, if you feel there is any other topic that you would like to see in this webinar series, please send it to us because we want wanting to make sure that we're always on point with what you need. Madam Program Director, panel members, and everybody who's on the call, allow me to declare this meeting closed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof, for that. We really appreciate that. We appreciate you, taxpayers, for staying around, for sticking around, even though we are out of time. We're saying halala, halala, just to remind you that this session is available on the SAS TV, YouTube, and you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, hashtag your tax matters. Remember, before, uh, as you exit this, to complete our a survey as it also help us to improve. It also help us to hear you out. It also help us to give us an idea of what else can we educate you on. Ma Africa Amandle Tolansin. Goodbye. Fellow South Africans, I'm addressing you this year. All your years of paying tax. You helped us overcome our darkest hour. You, along with every other loyal taxpayer, helped build this nation. Thank you for every life you saved and for every risk you braved, for giving our future generation a healthy start. When you saw many of our vulnerable communities, you provided for them. When you saw our healthcare workers on the front lines battling COVID, you rose to the occasion and gave them the tools to save lives. Without your tax compliance, we wouldn't be able to fight a good fight. Thank you for contributing to the important services our vulnerable communities rely on every day. To all taxpayers and traders, continue to pay your tax because it matters to millions of South Africans who depend on it. Your tax matters.